It's a hot one in H-Town, and the hottest title is on the line at Fury FC 82 as Ferris Moran takes on Alberto Trujillo for the flyweight title. But first, we have a stacked car featuring some of the best Fury amateurs and pros, and a amateur title is on the line right here at the Imagine Venues in H-Town. It is time for these fighters to unleash the Fury, and welcome in. I'm Rahil Ramsnali, joined by the black belt himself, Michael Alexander, and UFC veteran Alex Morono. And Alex you are pumped for this prelims fight, man. What do you got? Yeah, man. Powerhouse Andrew Slaughterbach is fighting kickboxing specialist Dayton Ames for our opening Ooh. bout. That's awesome. And then Carlos Cepeda fighting Lee No Refund Charles, one of the <laughs> hardest hitting guys on the Fury roster. He's always fun to watch. Hey, and how about some of these amateurs are making noise worldwide? I don't know if you can exactly call them amateurs. We have Olympic caliber wrestling from one of our female athletes tonight. I cannot wait. You will not see this on any other prelims. Unbelievable. And as I mentioned, the 205 title is on the line. De Leon taking on Pineda. Let's get things going and join the fourth member of our broadcast crew. He is the hottest man in H-Town. Here he is, Wayne Leggett. Hello, fight fans, and welcome to Escapade at Imagine Venues in Houston, Texas. This is Fury FC 82, Moran versus Trujillo. But first, please welcome to the cage for your opening preliminary contest, Dayton Ames. Dayton Ames, Austin, Texas stand up, but man, he brought a crowd with a nice little pop here for Dayton Ames. The kickboxing background, as you just mentioned, Alex, a lot of people excited to watch Ames throw down in his debut, and you see he's in great shape. Yeah, he's a pretty big guy. I uh, actually had one of my guys kickbox against him in Dallas, and the fight was at 165 pounds. And I was like, man, he's a good-sized welterweight, but turns out he's a lightweight. I mean, he's fighting at 155 tonight for his uh, his mixed martial arts debut. I was unaware. You know, he did a lot of grappling. We just assumed he was a kickboxer when we did our tape study. But, man, he seems to be well-rounded. And I'll tell you, he's got a really tough debut than Andrew Slaughterbach. This is, this is such an insane opening bout. Both guys are great prospects. Both guys are super physical, super technical. It really doesn't get much better than this. Yeah, and at 155, Alex, they're just adding to the stable of lightweights we have in that division, the amateur and eventually the pros, because both of these guys, I expect big things out of them as an amateur, but even bigger things in them in the future to, whenever they become pros. All right, Dayton is inside, so let's meet his opponent. Please welcome to the red corner, Andrew Lauterbach. Andrew Lauterbach. <laughs> Second time inside the Fury FC cage, but really making the walk for the third time because the first time the fight was a no contest, so he made that walk. The second fight, it was a rematch against Andrew Villarreal where he got that nice win. It was a gritty win, and now making the walk to the cage for the third time, and man, this guy can hit. Yeah, yeah, so he, Andrew Slaughterbach is, is, is what gonna be his ring name, that's what he prefers. So Slaughterbach, that's a cool name. Blinks well with his last name. But man, he was actually a little disappointed when he won that, that rematch. And I told him, I was like, hey man, that guy was good. That fight was competitive. It took place everywhere. When you're a pro, you'll be very grateful that fight was as challenging as it was because it will forge you into a better fighter. And his match today in Dayton Ames will be no easier. But man, I know Andrew, he trains with mostly pros. You know, the guys at war, they probably have the most active training room of, of amateur and pro fighters. You know, I, he gives me great rounds. Because again, like I, I can't tell you guys how insanely good of a first fight for a big card this will be. It's going to be so much fun. You mentioned the nickname, Slaughterbach, taking on the Bullfrog. Dayton Ames, and you see our tail to tape. The reach advantage goes to Andrew. Just a slight height advantage. Both guys did make weight. And the 26-year-old Dayton Ames going in there trying to make some noise like a Bullfrog. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but have you all ever heard of Bullfrog scream? <laughs> no. It's not as deep as you think. It actually sounds like a toddler. I learned about this on Friday night, so there you go. A little fun fact for you. Let's get our official introductions. Here's Wayne. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your opening preliminary contest brought to you by Space City Collective is scheduled for three rounds in the Fury Amateur Series Lightweight Division. Introducing your first competitor fighting out of the blue corner. Representing John's Gym in Austin, Texas, this mixed martial artist stands 5 feet 9 inches tall and he weighed in officially at 154.4 pounds. 
Fighting out of Austin, Texas. Today he makes his amateur debut. Here is Dayton Ames. And introducing his opponent across the cage, fighting out of the red corner. Representing the War Training Center, this freestyle fighter stands 5 feet 10 inches tall and he weighed in at 154 pounds even. Fighting out of Houston, Texas, his amateur record stands at one win, no losses. This is Andrew Slaughterbuck, Slaughterbuck! Your referee in charge of the action, Patrick Patlon. All right, Patrick Patlon gets the first assignment of the night. Blue trunks, blue gloves for Ames, red gloves for Slaughterbach. Let's get this thing going. Oh, oh man, huge right hand from Slaughterbach. Right off the bat. Nice clinch knee. Oh, no, oh. big right hand just right behind oh. the ear. That's going to take your equilibrium off. Slaughterbach's oh, hand is out so again. Heavy. I think we're going to see a finish here. Man, these are huge shots. Andrew's not holding back at all. He's got a nice front headlock. His Good. coaches are asking him for a break. I think that'd be smart. As those right hands are landing just right behind the oh. ear. And there it is again. And this fight's over. That's it. Man, huge that knockout it. here for Andrew Slaughterbach. Wow. Slaughterbach making noise in the first round. Those were some big punches. Those were some technical punches, and those were on target for a big win. His second of his amateur career, that's the kind of night it's going to be. Man, so Slaughterbomb, he's what we call a ripper. I mean, guys just go in there, measure with the jab, and bomb an overhand. And I know in doing some tape study on Dayton, Dayton's kind of a slow starter, very measured, can keep the pace for three rounds. But man, Slaughterbomb came out there like a stick of dynamite, and was just ripping those right hands. Man, he is hyped up. Woo, let's take a look at the highlights, a.k.a. the entire fight. How'd you see that low leg kick right there? And then oh. right, that big overhand right landed right behind the ear. Man, drops. And then it was just the Lauterbach show from there. Man, I mean, Dayton, he ate those shots well. Those shots are weird shots. When you get it behind the ear, and it really throws your legs Ooh. for a weird spin. You can't control your motor functions. I mean... Wow, it's three just gigantic right hands to lead to this knockout victory for Andrew Slaughterbach. Alex, that kid is not going to be an amateur for long. No, super. Ooh. So 20 years old and trains like a pro. Yeah. Man, that training matters. Who you train with, how often you train with. You've got the talent. All right, let's go inside and make this thing official. Ladies and gentlemen, referee Patrick Patlon calls for a stop to the action. 34 seconds into the very first round, declaring a winner by TKO, Andrew Slaughterbach, Slaughterbach! And that's a young man who believes in himself and his abilities. And that is a scary proposition for the rest of the amateur division 155ers. Man, I thought he was going to try to pick a fight with somebody else in the crowd. He was ready to go again. <laughs> is he always that intense? Man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he is. <laughs> All right, let's meet our next fighter. Please welcome to the blue corner, Wendy Anunson. Wendy Anunson, 7-3 and three amateur record, first time inside the Fury FC cage. Has been fighting since 2020, so she's been very busy since that amateur debut. Has went on a three-fight win streak, Alex, to Michael, and, and then had a two-fight losing streak, then a four-fight win streak. So she has a lot of experience, guys. Yeah, and, you know, sometimes if the, if the winning streak comes after a losing streak, that means they learned a ton in those three wins. And so it looks like that's the case here with, with Wendy. You know, she's a, she's a well-rounded fighter, and, you know, at 7-3, that's a lot of experience, especially for a, a, one, a, a flyweight female, because they don't stand, they don't last at the amateur division very long. Yeah, this is maybe the most fights I've seen uh, a female amateur have. I mean, and she's 28. I'm surprised they haven't made that jump to the professional stage yet. But maybe they're looking to test her, and, uh, and Alex Law, her opponent, is very, very crap, very gritty, and she'll scrap. This is going to be a fun fight as well. 
Fighting out of High Point, North Carolina, training in Reno, or excuse me, hometown of Reno. Battleborn BJJ in MMA, that's where she's been training. She is inside, let's meet her opponent. Please welcome to the red corner, Alex LaWall. And Alex, you mentioned Alex LaWall, the three and one record. First time inside the Fury cage though. Somebody that we've been trying to get inside here and get a chance to look at it. Alex is finally making the Fury FC amateur walk, which we're excited about. Competes in a lot of grappling tournaments. Should have a really good overall game from all I've been watching. Yeah, I know one of her teammates, Rain Guerrero, she's fighting on the Contender Series here pretty soon. I know they get a lot of rounds in together. Uh, every time I'm in the war with the pros, with like the welterweights and 85ers, I always see her in there as well. You know, always throwing down. She got a, she's very well rounded, but, uh, but man, she got some, some good hands and she's just gritty. She'll just like throw down in a fight. So I do expect this fight to take place everywhere. I wouldn't be surprised if this always goes doing a bit of grappling as well, but I mean, this is another really fun fight. And she goes to show, you know, with a record of 7 and 3 and 3 and 1, two great amateur records being our second fight of the night. She's good to show how stacked this card is. You mentioned Ray Guerrero, contender series coming up pretty soon. You already had Zach Reese get the contract. We'll talk a little bit more about uh, what's been happening on Contender Series. But first, our show tape brought to you by Sheath Underwear. The insane reach advantage for Alex LaWall and the height advantage as well for the 25-year-old. Both fighters are inside. Let's get our official introductions. Here is Wayne Leggett. The following contest brought to you by SheathUnderwear.com is scheduled for three rounds in the Fury Amateur Series Flyway Division. Introducing first, fighting out of the blue corner, representing Battleborn BJJ and MMA. This mixed martial artist stands five feet three inches tall and she weighed in officially at 123.2 pounds. Fighting out of Reno, Nevada, her amateur record stands at seven wins, only three losses. This is Wendy Bonesaw and Unsung. And introducing her opponent across the cage, fighting out of the red corner. Representing the War Training Center, this freestyle fighter stands 5 feet 5 inches tall and she weighed in at 125.2 pounds. Fighting out of Houston, Texas, her amateur record stands at three wins. Only one defeat. Here is Alex LaWall. Your referee in charge, Professor Joe Solis. All right, Professor Joe Solis with the assignment. Both females inside. Blue gloves for Anderson and red for LaWall. Nice, good commitment there from the one-two, from Wendy. You see Alex using a good jab, trying to measure range. She sticks it there. Looks for an uppercut on the entry. You can see Wendy was having a little bit of trouble in those first exchanges with the reach. Nice, both girls very measured and technical, using the jab well. And nice one-two there from Anderson. You can see when he's already showing a little bit of redness in the nose from some of those jabs. Oh, ooh. Bad intentions behind that head kick. Oh, yeah. She almost overshot it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. That was a good, nice, that was a good, a well timed counter takedown there from Wendy, but man, a nice one, too, there from Alex right before. Nice. Good get up there, too. There's always risk in that. Oh, ooh. big right hand there from Wendy. Alex did the right thing, clinching up. There's another one of those shots landed just right behind the ear. That'll just scramble your circuits. Yeah, and Wendy not afraid to get in there and tangle with her, even though she's, you know, at a big disadvantage reach-wise. You know, she's staying in the pocket. She's uh, she's exchanging punches with her and landing. A big punch. She almost went to the mat there. Oh, yeah. 11th sure. amateur fight there for Wendy Anderson, and you can see that measured approach and timing everything perfectly, and... For Alex, she was in action back in May. Got a nice finish in round two. Yeah, Wendy with a nice single leg running the pipe there to get Alex to the back to her back again. She's got to be careful here. Those long limbs, 
from the bottom, especially with a with an open guard, but seems very aware. Steps right over into half guard here. Nice yeah. pass. Yeah, very technical there from Wendy. Even the single that you had mentioned earlier, Mike, was just really just technically appropriate. Good fundamental single leg takedown. Strong guard pass, transition to the back, looking for that second hook. She has it now. Nice little left hand there. Trying to open up the neck, but Alex pretty hip to the hand fighting. Yeah, she's course. got it now. This is very, very tight. So that supporting hand needs to be behind the head. I mean, I'm sure this is tight. She got to peel that hand down. She has to peel that hand down if she wants to survive this choke. Yeah, it looks like she's, doesn't look like Wendy's palm to palm. It's still really tight, but I don't think it oh, should man. finish from there. Oh, that oh there it, it is. That was yeah, that's, the slip that's up, it. and that is that's it. it. Good tap there. Wow. Eight, per, eight amateur win for Wendy Anderson, and she got involved in the little hand play and figured it out, got that opening, and just yeah. got the tap. Yeah, Wendy was good, man. I mean, what, eight and three now? I think that's time to go pro, man. I know I'm kind of, you know, talking in place for coaches, but I mean, that's a lot of amateur fights. She's, she's definitely not on the younger side of the fighters. Yeah, and not just that, Alex, but I mean, she just made pretty short work of a very good yeah, very Alex good. Wall, so. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that uh, a pro fight is somewhere near in her future. Alex Wall, very emotional about that loss. Here we go, we see a good jab from Wendy Anderson there. And saw a very nice one-two there from Alex Wall and a duck under double leg takedown. See, there's that big shot right over the, the left ear of Alice Wall, and then here it was, she got the back, created some scrambles, got to the back, and once she got here, that was it. Alice Wall just had to tap, or it was night night. Nice performance there from, from Wendy Anderson. Yeah, that was really deep. Can't wait to see her turn pro. Hopefully it's here with the Fury umbrella. That'd be awesome to see, because we need more talented women inside Fury, because, hey, they can get UFC contracts as well, and that's one thing we're really good at. Yeah. Yeah, we're proving that every week on the Contender Series and, and otherwise. All right, let's make this thing official. Here is Wayne without any of the fighters. Ladies and gentlemen, the end comes two minutes, 48 seconds into the very first round. Declaring a winner by tap out due to a rear naked choke, Wendy Bonesaw and Anderson. Congratulations to Wendy Anderson on a huge win. And another first round finish, gentlemen. I'm telling you, there's something in the air. It's hot outside. Nobody. Hey, everybody just wants to make some noise in here. Stay cool. All right, let's get our next fighter. Please welcome to the blue corner, Eddie Lopez. Okay, this is one of the coolest yes. stories you'll ever hear regarding MMA and pursuing your dream, Michael. Yeah, Eddie Lopez, uh, you know, Bob Perez was in New York uh, a few months ago, and Eddie Lopez ran into him, and uh, you know they started talking. Eddie Lopez was homeless. Told Bob Perez, "I really, really want to fight MMA." And Bob Perez says, "My man, if you can make it down to Houston, Texas, I'll train you." Thirty days later, Eddie Lopez walks into his door, and here we are, Eddie Lopez making his debut as an amateur. And you can see he's in really good shape. Uh, you know we don't we don't know that much about it because as you can as you as we said, you know he was. He was homeless in New York, and uh, I'm sure Bob's taking care of him over there now. But man, there's uh, this is just kind of the story that you love to see and hope that they succeed. All right, Eddie is inside. Let's meet his opponent. Please welcome to the red corner, Zach Lowry. Zach Lowry is not an easy opponent to make your debut against fifth time inside the Fury Amateur Cage, but hasn't fought since 2021. It's been a long time. I mean, the la I mean, one of the last fights was Justice Torres of March of 2021, and we know how much justice has progressed. But Zach is one of those guys that now is hopefully recommitting, and we can see a little bit more of him. 
Yeah, it's funny, if you look at the, the, the one at the very end of his record, that was a draw for a title fight for Fury against one of my guys. And uh, so we did a lot of tape showing him. Lowry's got a, a really interesting build and background. I know he was in the military. He's short, he's explosive. Um, but but he's just not been able to find super consistent success. You know, there was some time off. I'm sure he used that to get better. And, uh, and man, this, this is honestly a bit of a mystery fight because, you know, Lowry's got the experience. He's got the improvements. But like you guys were talking about, Eddie Lopez, I mean, he's truly a mystery fighter. And he's, a, he's an athletic specimen, too. This will be a fun, explosive fight. But Lowry has a really good guillotine choke. You look at our tail of the tape brought to you by Howler Head Whiskey. You see the height advantage, and you see the frantic style of Eddie Lopez and that reach advantage for the 25-year-old as well. Made weight. Let's get our official introduction. The following contest brought to you by the law office of Eric Smith is scheduled for three rounds in the Fury Amateur Series Lightweight Division. Introducing your first competitor, fighting out of the blue corner. Representing Main Street Boxing, this freestyle fighter stands 5 feet 11 inches tall, and he weighed in at 153 pounds. Fighting out of the Bronx in New York, today he makes his amateur debut. Here is Mambo Lopez! And introducing his opponent across the cage, fighting out of the red corner, representing the dark side. This mixed martial artist stands 5 feet 6 inches tall, and he weighed in at a perfect 155 pounds. Fighting out of Houston, Texas, he holds an amateur record of two wins, one loss, one draw. This is Zach Lowry! Your referee in charge of the action, Patrick Patlon. All right, Patrick Patlon with the assignment here. 155 showdown blue gloves for Lopez, red for Lowry. So formidable size difference as Mama instantly stalks and Lowry instantly shoots. Sometimes that's a really good idea against these debut guys who are showing a lot of energy. Make them wrestle, get those arms tired. That'll, uh, that'll take a lot of the steam off of the punches. And then I'll tell you, reading the body language of Lopez, he was looking, he was looking to come out hard. Hit throw attempt there from Lopez. Larry did a good job staying topside, staying on his feet. Yeah, Lopez doing a good job of avoiding the takedown. And Alex, you couldn't get two more opposite body styles than <laughs> you have right here. You know, short and stocky against tall and you know, kind of lanky, a 10-inch reach advantage for, for Lopez. But, you know, the wrestling and sometimes that, ooh, nice. Ooh, Eddie Lopez showing some skills so far. Oh, yeah, e even in his shadow boxing in the, the pre-film, I mean, he was moving his head well, throwing big shots. I mean, he had to have some sort of fighting background prior to meeting Bob. And props to Bob for, you know, taking this guy in. I mean, that's just destiny, that's faith, whatever you want to call it, man. That's incredible that they met in Times Square. The millions of people that walked through there. These two cross paths, and 30 days later, Lopez gets to Houston, ready to train. Nice little rear trip. He just went over that in our wrestling class on Friday. And again, but 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 Mambo is, is just not taking the takedown for an answer. He's staying on his feet, looking to counter, hit deep, deep underhooks. See the little handoff again. I mean, that was the same thing he did earlier. Larry made a bit of a mistake shooting for that leg. If he can get that right arm across the hip, he can square him up and secure that, you know, kind of counter takedown. But he's, Lowry's got to get his right arm around the hip. I mean, he's going to maybe slide into a triangle from here. Eat some shots. One of those weird scrambles. That's yeah. that triangle. If I mean, if Mambo can figure four on that right side, Lowry's going to be in a world of hurt right now. He cannot let the figure four happen. Yeah, here it goes. He just kind of let him do it there. Let's see if he can get the angle. I can't tell I, from I the back side. I think his arm is in. Lowry's left arm is kind of in. His hand is in, but I mean, that's skin deep. Oh, yeah, you can still finish that from there. There's a couple weird, um, like, Baracho Plata, Plata finishes that he's going for. Put a weird tweak on the shoulder. But in MMA, I don't think I've ever seen it actually finish someone. It's very painful, but... Yeah, he's got to be careful here, Alex, because as soon as he pulls that hand out, he's, Zach Lowry's going to be free on that side. Yeah. 
15 seconds to work with. Well, 10 seconds to work with. <laughs> Interesting exchange here. And I'll tell you, for Mambo, I mean, this is Lowry's fifth fight. You know, one of those for a title. He's very experienced. And for that title fight, they went all five rounds. So, I mean, he's got a lot of cage time, Lowry does. He's felt this many times before. Whereas this is, you know, new to Mambo. But Mambo's done well, man. Very technical. He's very technical in this opening round. Yeah, and Alex, you know, as you know, I always look at their posture between rounds. And Eddie Lopez standing very tall, very alert over there. And it looks like Lowry is a little bit... He looked like he was a little bit gassed whenever he came up, but he wrestled a lot and, you know, to, to no avail. He wasn't able to get him to the ground. And you see Eddie standing back on his feet. Look at our highlights real quickly. Slick little trip there. Looks for the back take, but man, again, Mambo did a really good job not accepting bad positions. Even when he was on bottom, he was attacking. Yeah, he was attaching, attacking, not many punches thrown in that first round, but um, I, I mean, I think I would have to give it to Lopez, maybe. Uh, it's very, very close. Maybe they gave him uh, credit for the takedown, but you know, once he got down there, he was on defense almost the whole time. Oh, nice nice. Open kick there from Lowry. And he ate a Mambo right hand and given that kick. Nice high kick there from Lowry. Switching stances, throwing big kicks. A good way to negate a 10-inch reach advantage is to use your legs. Yeah, and that, uh, that uh, Eddie Lopez has to continue to use that jab to keep that distance. Oh, oh. Uh, that was a very bad cage grab. That stopped that takedown. Man, there was no real penalty for it. But, I mean, Lowry found an opening anyway as he's got near full back exposure. Lowry doesn't even get that right hook yet. Notice Mambo's doing a good job keeping his own right leg nice and tight, trying to protect the hip exactly from that hook, as he uses his left hand to clear the other hook. I mean, that's good. Technical, you know, back to simply. Yeah, and he's doing the right thing. He's, he's making sure that he's unchokable with the hands before he starts paying attention to the feet. And a lot of people make that mistake. They try to beat him to the feet and then, you know, try to untangle the feet before they get choked, and it just rarely works oh. that way. Those were three good punches, and then he got the hook in, but then he lost the bottom hook as he looks to scramble his hips and get on top of the half guard. That's good grappling there from Lowry. That's when you anticipate your opponent's escapes and you beat them as the transition's happening, if not slightly before. The ground game of Zach Lowry is definitely one of his strong points, and he can wear you out. Yeah, he's kind of settled into this pace. Now, I think Mambo's kind of feeling, feeling, you know, the fight fatigue of all the wrestling. Yeah, and the thing about being in half guard on the bottom as the taller guy, I mean, it's really difficult to untangle your legs from there whenever they're, you know, putting space in there. You got to get, you got to get your hips way further away to be able to get a knee shield in or anything. It makes it really, really difficult. It's when a guy's constantly pushing forward makes it extremely difficult to get out of this half guard position. You almost have to give up something to, to, to try to get uh, to where you want to go. What should Eddie give up here? Man, I think he should. He's got to get his hands down by the hips. He's going to take a punch, but he's got to get his hands down by the hips. He's got to take some separation and then maybe switch sides, maybe switch to his other hip, but he, he's got to do something explosive and he's got to get you know both arms. You don't want your elbows above your shoulders. Anytime that's the case, and Zach Lowry's doing a good job of keeping his elbows above his shoulders, uh, or keeping the uh, shoulders of, of Lopez above his shoulders, or the elbows above Lopez's shoulders, because it makes him weak. See, Mambo inverting for a knee bar, but there's just no time. Man, you gotta be careful here, because... Right, it's back for a straight ankle. Ooh. Decent, uh, a decent attempt at an ankle lock. I mean, I don't think any damage <laughs> yeah, is done, but, but I mean... He had the position and the bite. Give him a little more time, and we've been talking about something a little more dangerous. Might as well go for it with less than five seconds oh, left. Yeah. You never know, right? You never know. All right, so round three, here we come. First two fights, we're finished in round one. If you're just joining us, we do have four more amateur fights for you. Two pro fights on our prelims as well.
We take a look at our highlights for round two. Yeah, in round two, Raheel, it was mostly Zach Lowry. Zach Lowry got him to the ground. You see that cage grab there that probably should have stopped the action um, for, and at least gave him a warning, but uh, Zach Lowry gets him to the ground, and then once he gets this, it's kind of this was kind of the story of round two, this position. You know, uh, right at the end, Lopez was able to get around to get to a position maybe for a leg lock, but ended up kind of going in Zach Lowry's favor in the end. And we saw a little extracurricular activity there after the bell rang. Eddie Lopez not happy about the way that round ended. Man, Alex, that was just like the opening of round two. Big <laughs> kick and then a big right exchange from Lopez. He timed that one a little bit better as well. And do a shot man for <laughs> yeah. Pretty good wrestling from Lowry. He's quick. Ooh, big body kick. Almost having no, no part of that wrestling, man. He's staying low and he's swinging. Try to time a, a bit of a kick. But Lowry's in. He's got his hands connected. I'd be surprised if we didn't see this finished. I just got to commit to a big scoop, a big lift and scoop. Oh, but man, Mambo got his hands together. It's a pretty common wrestling hold to neutralize the hip lift ability of the attacker. But Lowry found success. All the same. We'll see if Lowry can't step that left leg over. Maybe try to pin the legs. And then they're getting stuck in close guard where in MMA is just, just fine. He scored the takedown. He's got top control. And he's got Mambo's head pushed up against his cage. It's an uncomfortable position. Yeah, and these amateur rounds go quick. Only three minutes in these amateur rounds. Uh, round is almost halfway over here in the third. And I think Zach Taylor, round one was really close. For sure he won round two. Uh, so I would think the winner of this one's, you know, either has a chance or is definitely, if it's Zach Lowry, he's definitely going to win this fight. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. I think if you're in Mambo's corner, you got to say, hey, man, you got to finish just to be safe. And look at that. Yep, As he goes go. to that triangle again. And again, if he can figure for that lock, that's what makes these so dangerous and potent. And like the time to escape is now. It is not when it's fully locked in. I mean, yep. you got to hit that nitro button and just blast your head out of there. Or super posture up or force an arm in or pull an arm out. I mean, this is a nasty spot for Lowry. Yeah, oh, that's, that's terrible. A, that's a Ooh. Oh, wicked little yeah, that's awful. modified Kimura. I mean, he lost position. Yeah, you can oh, tell. Oh, man, if he locks this man. up here. So you see how his left hand is in. It doesn't mean the choke won't work. It just won't work as effectively. Dead. And yeah, his head's out. I mean, he needs to bail. A hard bail in this position. Force half guard, or force close guard. Totally excellent, let him up. But man, he's just playing with fire with those triangles. But I mean, Lowry must deal with this a lot, being a wrestler. You know, guillotines and triangles are often their kryptonite. But you get a guy who shoots enough and deals with them enough, they get really comfortable defending them. Yeah, very nice sweep there. Oh, oh so man, got now Lopez. 20 seconds left. Yeah, Lopez has got to pass out some punches here. He's got to do some damage. Lowry just holding up against the cage. 10 seconds left. Let's see if he's going to try to get a big lift and finish. One final statement here. Another cage grab. Oh, oh and another oh. try. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, I mean, he just, you, you mentioned it, like, he just must be comfortable in that position because there's no panic ever, right? Like, he was just cool, waiting for that perfect time to Man. get out, but you're, you're right, playing with fire, and he survived. He didn't get burned. Like, like the triangle choke in Jiu Jitsu is my best submission by far. Like, you get a really good triangle choker and you give him that opportunity, it's not going to be so easy. But I mean, props to Lowry for surviving and props to Mambo for finding them and locking them in. Yeah, and I mean, a little bit of jiu-jitsu training for uh, for Lau or for Lopez, and I mean, that triangle choke is going to be there. Uh, you know, you can just tell it was just a lack of technical skill, uh, but once he gets that little bit of technical skill, then I'm surely they're going to show him it uh, on Monday. This is how you finish a triangle from those positions, because I think he could have finished the fight maybe two or three times, Alex. Yeah. A good fight. That was a fun fight for a pretty heavy grappling yeah. contest. I mean, that was, that was, that was high-paced, a lot of attacks and reversals and takedowns. Got a little bit of everything there. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see Lopez get some more training in uh, and, you know, get, a, get a, a little bit more skill behind him because, you know, his cardio seems to be good. Uh, we didn't get to see much of his striking because of the wrestling style of Lowry, but, uh, you know, he defended well. And then when he was on his back, of course, he attacked well. Just, like you said, just a little bit of technical skill short of being able to finish those moves once he got down there.
Yeah, and it's curious to see what these judges find more valuable. The submission attempts for the top position. We'll find out here in just a second. All right, looks like they've calculated everything. Wayne is inside. Let's make this thing official. See how the judges scored it. Ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds of combat, we go to the judges' scorecards for your decision. Brought to you by Space City Collective. Judge Michelle Morales scores the fight 29-28, Lowry. Judge Ricardo Delgado scores the fight 29-28, Lopez. And Judge Daniel Guevara scores the fight 29-28, declaring a winner by split decision. Mambo Lopez! Oh, wow. Okay, they what did, do y'all think? I mean, they valued the submission attempts over the top position. Now, I think if Larry had, like, got the side control mount of the back and done some damage, I mean, easy decision. You know, that, that's, that's, a, that's a close one. That's a controversial one, but, I mean... Finishing fights is doing damage. Finishing fights the way to win. Mamba went for it. All right, let's meet our next fighter. Please welcome to the blue corner, Terrence Chapman. Terrence Chapman. Man, the Metro Club guys, Metro Fight Club guys are pumped <laughs> for Terrence's debut. I mean, everywhere on his Instagram, you see all the fighters just hyping him up. We were talking to Richard Burmaster before today's card, and he was just telling us, like, yes, they've been telling him for a while. You see all the, the big names there in his corner. I can't wait for this debut. Yeah, and not just that. I'm happy to see another heavyweight coming into the division here at Fury, because especially if people are so high on him. I mean, our heavyweights are really having a hard time getting people to sign because they're so good. So another, uh, hopefully, a, another uh, addition to the heavyweight division. I know it's amateur right now, but all that means is if he's good, if within a year, he'll be a pro at heavyweight. Yeah, get a couple of wins, and he'll be there. I mean, that's how it works. And the heavyweight show is just so much fun to watch. And especially the Metro guys, they're actually known for their boxing. So, I mean, teach a heavyweight how to box, and, 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 that's, and that's how you get finishers. That's how you get fans I'm excited. A, boxing, really a heavyweight that can box is a scary, scary thing. Oh, yeah. And I mean, look, frankly, if you are a good heavyweight and you can rise the ranks of Fury, get a couple of pro fights, you could be a call-up very fast in the UFC. We've seen it happen before. Yeah. So it's very possible if you catch fire, within the next two years, you're in the UFC, if not faster sometimes. Yeah. All right, Terrence is inside. Let's meet his opponent. Please welcome to the red corner, Amin Gossam Khani. Amin Gossam Khani. First time inside Fury. The Iranian making his way here to debut for Fury. Both of his wins so far, or excuse me, he has an 0-1 record. So there's some controversy regarding this because we've seen a 2-0 record floating around. We've seen 0-1. We're going to go with the official 0-1 record, but he does have some experience from what I've heard. Yeah, he's got some height on him, too. He's 6'4", I mean, 261. This guy's a true heavyweight. This yes. is a big man. Um, but oddly enough, man, the, the build of Terrence is very unique as Terrence has a longer reach. Whereas, whereas I mean, is much taller. I mean, I no matter the stats, I think we're gonna see two big men go down in just a few minutes. I'm excited for that. Yeah, and we've seen it before, Alex, where you don't have to be the tallest heavyweight. Mark Hunt made a lot of money and made a big name for himself oh, as yeah. a, you know, six foot tall or under uh, heavyweight. You know, it's it's about those knockouts. You see our tail of the tape brought to you by Live Oak Texas Vodka. The height advantage. Going to Amin, the reach advantage going to Terrence, 26, 27 year olds. Both guys are ready and inside. We've got some big boys ready to throw down. So let's get our official introductions. The following contest brought to you by Live Oak Texas Vodka is scheduled for three rounds in the Fury Amateur Series Heavyweight Division. Introducing first fighting out of the blue corner. Representing Metro Fight Club, this mixed martial artist is six feet, one inch tall, and he weighed in officially at 250.2 pounds. Fighting out of Houston, Texas, today he makes his amateur debut, 
This is Terrence Chadman. And introducing his opponent across the cage, fighting out of the red corner. This freestyle fighter stands six feet four inches tall, and he weighed in at 261 pounds. Fighting out of Russia, Iran. Today, he too makes his amateur debut. This is Amin Gossip Khani. Your referee in charge, Professor Joe Solis. Professor Joe Solis inside with these gigantic men. <laughs> Who gloves for Chapman? Oh, Red nice for Gossip Connie. Oh, nice jabs. Yeah, Gossip Connie came <laughs> out with a stiff. Actually, both guys, <laughs> stiff jabs they're right both, off the bat. They're both two for, two for jabs. You see some redness there, left eye, Chapman. Backed up too much. Can't give up that. that oh, a little left hand there. Yeah, a little dirty boxing there from Chapman. Yeah. There he tries that lateral throw, Alex, that you hate. Oh yeah. It's just <laughs> risky if it fails, and it fails. You get up, you get on bottom, not in guard. Especially as a heavyweight, if that fails, it can be devastating. Yeah. We get a true test of the structural integrity of this cage, right, <laughs> right by us. Hope it passes because yeah. we're going to be the ones absorbing uh, Ooh, any stomp. collateral damage. Yeah, I mean, said enough of those foot stomps. <laughs> we wanted to get his feet moving here. Nice little over under volley here from these boys. Actually, Terrence now has a full body lock. Loses it though. So this is where you don't want to see heavyweights fighting because this position requires a lot of energy. Zaps the arms. Yeah, and you'll see on the break. You can see Amin already winding up for that break. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you called it. Yeah. <laughs> like, these guys go back to their jabs. I mean, they're both just so stiff. And they require the least amount of energy. And you can see Amin's got the triple XL Fury gloves on. I'm only assuming that, but they look like it. Yeah, those hands look like lunch boxes. Thank you. Nice head movement there from Chapman. A lot of kicks, which again, of all attacks, require the most fuel. Under one minute left in round one. So Terrence, you know, is a you know 10, 15 pounds lighter, but you can tell he moves, moves quicker. Moves like the smaller man, the lighter man. A good big low kick there from Terrence. That was a thudder. There was no real smack on it. Ooh, nice ooh. jab there from Terrence again. Snap that head back. Oh, big oh. right hand. We see a little bit of the blood coming out of the nose of Amin from that jab of Terrence. Yeah, Amin trying oh. for the... Ooh, nice there's a big hook. left hand. He's got about 15 seconds here. He needs to attack. Ooh, oh. beautiful <laughs> head movement and counters from Chapman. Here he goes. 10 seconds. Let's see if Amin can oh, survive the round. Out. Mouthpiece out. Here he goes. Oh. Boom, big oh. right hand. This that is it. For I mean, he's asleep. Oh man, yeah, he. Is. Oh, they got a ooh. Oh man. man, they opened that cage door. He fell out. I mean, he, he I like mean, slumped over. Wow. I mean, spilled out the door of the cage over there. He's out, uh, man. He was out. Big oh. shots. Big shots. Good from Terrence. Young, fast, good hands. I mean, it's a big left hand and a big right hook that dropped, and he landed two follow-ups to the ground and put him out. Yeah, it, was, it looked like the nerves got the best of him at the first of the fight. But once he settled down, he started getting his range. His head movement was good. He allowed Amin to go. And he was seeing those openings while he was moving his head, while he was dodging those punches. Knew where the openings were going to be. Provoked him into another exchange. Counterpunched and lights out for Amin. Beautiful job by Chapman. Man, Terrence Chapman. There's a reason why so many of the Metro guys were high on him. Nice debut win in our amateur series here. And for Amin Gossam Khani, he is up and sitting. He's fine. But man, let's take a look at the highlights, especially that finish. Yeah, nice right hand to the body there. Oh, big overhand right that barely, barely missed. 
Here he is with that head movement. That little Anderson Silva there. Head movement right into a jab. And then here we go with that big overhand oh, right, right on the temple. There's another shot right to the temple, out. and the eyes are out. out. Oh, man. And one to grow on. Yeah, you can see Amina's in rough shape there, and then he spills out the door as soon as they open it. Curious to see how much time was left. It looked like it was about a second left or two, so we'll get the official time here. Make this thing official. Here's Wade. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Joe Solis stops this one with one second remaining in the very first round, declaring a winner by knockout, Terrence Chatman. Man, literally at the buzzer. That is crazy. One second left. What a finish there for Terrence Chatman. Yeah, Raheel, even if they let that one go, I don't think Amin would have came out for the second round. Even if they would have said it was at the after the buzzer, I don't think he would have been able to come out for after the second round. I mean, he was pretty rocked. He was pretty out of it while he was there up against the cage. Terrence doesn't have a nickname yet. Maybe buzzer beater. I don't Maybe know. So. All right, let's make. Uh, let's get our next fighter. Welcome to the blue corner, Victoria Anthony. At the bell, Terrence. I don't know. I'm gonna be uh, workshopping some <laughs> nicknames for Terrence here. But now, Victoria Anthony, we talked to you about Victoria as we joined you on the broadcast. There is a lot of excitement here for Victoria Anthony. Ten straight national teams for Team USA as a wrestler. Judo black belt. And Michael, four-time collegiate champion. Yeah, if you don't know wrestling and you don't know, uh, you know, kind of combat sports, you just don't know how how big of an accomplishment that is. Uh, you know, for a female that's fighting today at 110 pounds catch weight, uh, you know, that was probably under 100 pounds she was wrestling uh, in college and just absolutely killing people. I mean, I would put this small woman in here, I would put her against any 200 pound guy with no wrestling experience and she would take him down 100% of the time. Oh yeah. All right, let's meet her opponent. Please welcome to the red corner, Donia Cruz. Donia Cruz. She will bring the battle to you, and it's so much fun to watch. Fifth time inside the Fury Amateur Cage, three and two record so far. Last time out, lost to Amber Terrell for the Adam Waits trap. Back at FCC One Fury Challenger Series One in October of last year has been trying to get back and find that magic again, and Danya just breaks the fight to you. That's the best part. Yeah, then stylistically, she does a lot of uh, wall work, a lot of over-under work, clinch work on the cage, and man, this is not the opponent, I think, to you know implement that game plan. It'll be uh, interesting to see you know how uh, Danya you know, tries to find her path to victory, because it's going to be a challenging, challenging uh, opponent. Narnia Cruz, Russia, four ounce fight club. Looks to be in really good shape. Getting her final checkups here. Getting the work done there by our man. The best cut man in the business. Yeah, and good for Danya for taking this fight. I mean, not a lot of people want to fight a, you know, a, a wrestler with the accolades that uh, Victoria Anthony has. So it just shows you that, you know, it's, it's that anyone, anywhere uh, mentality. Our tail of tape brought to you by OnlyFans. The reach advantage going to Donya Cruz. Height advantage as well. The 32-year-old Victoria Anthony trying to get some fights and experience here at Fury. Both fighters are inside. Let's get our official introductions. The following contest brought to you by OnlyFans is scheduled for three rounds in the Fury Amateur Series at a catch weight of 110 pounds. Introducing your first competitor fighting out of the blue corner. Representing Fight Ready MMA, this mixed martial artist stands 4 feet 10 inches tall and she weighed in officially at 108.4 pounds. Fighting out of Scottsdale, Arizona, by way of Huntington Beach, California. Her amateur record stands at two wins, only one defeat. Here is Victoria Vortex Anthony. 
and introducing her opponent across the cage, fighting out of the red corner. Representing the four ounce fight club, this freestyle fighter stands five feet one inch tall and she weighed in at 109.8 pounds. Fighting out of Houston, Texas. Today she looks for amateur victory number four. Here is Tanya Crusher Cruz. Your referee in charge of the action, Patrick Patlon. All right, both women ready to go. Blue gloves for Anthony, red for Cruz. Final talks here, Patrick Patlon inside. Here's our first look at Victoria Anthony, who does have that one and one record. She competed earlier this year at the IMMAF Championships, which is just wild to me. I don't know if y'all have ever kept track with that, but you're fighting back-to-back -back days. And you just show up like it's a grappling tournament. <laughs> <laughs> you're fighting who you're fighting. Yeah, very quick shot there from Victoria. But man, Donnie did a good job, you know, stuffing that underhook and you know, getting her hips you know, out of that you know collection zone. Not saying she's out of the fray just yet, but she did a good job. And if anything, Danny has had like many fights, like multiple rounds in this position, so she's no stranger. I'll tell you, Victoria's using a, a, a lot of energy though, and I'm sure. I mean, look at her; she's a super athlete. I'm sure she can keep a pace. And, like even those punches to the body, usually not worth the, uh, you know, the calories spent doing it. But I mean, we'll see. There's that judo little head and arm throw. Oh, into an arm bar. Ooh. Oh, it's a good arm bar. Yeah, she's got to be careful here. She cleared the elbow. I don't think we're going to see a tap. But man, that just goes to show how crafty Donnie is. And that was a quick, quick transition. She's yeah, good on Victoria Anthony to have the, you know, to, to feel that. We just saw this on the Contender Series. A wrestler took a guy down. He, you know, he... he picked his hand up to punch and as soon as he did he got arm barred um, and you know the, the winner of that matchup ended up being one of our guys Zach Reese yep. oh, yeah. um, but uh, but the same thing very well could have happened there so good on Victoria for not for paying attention and, and uh, issuing all of her attention to that arm bar you yeah, notice her left elbow how it's just above like the hamstring of Donia if that elbow gets sucked in near like the waistline then she can be back in trouble but I think she's totally out of position now We've seen Victoria's pass to a full side control. Nice knee there from Anthony. By the way, if you want to see Alex Morono's reaction to Zach Reese's big win, go to UFC Fight Pass's Instagram account, and they posted the video, which was really cool to see. You, know, you and Zach have a good relationship oh, and yeah. have trained a lot together, correct? Oh, man, all, all, all so much. I love Big Zach. I can, I can try to hit him as hard as I can, and he never gets hurt. So he's my favorite <laughs> guy to train with. Yeah, such a nice guy, charismatic dude. I'm really excited for him to be in the UFC. And also, he's a real contender in that 185-pound division. That guy's good. Yeah, he really is. 6-0, six, oh, six first-round finishers. That's why I had, at the camera kid, I figured he would finish in the first. Yeah. Zach's a beast. He trained for like 10 weeks. I mean, he was over-prepared for that fight. That's awesome. Love so seeing, happy for him, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Love seeing good people get good wins. Notice the positioning here, Victoria just has Donia's shoulders flat as could be, deep underhook. Well, for first hit for Donia, not a bad first round. Thought this fight was going to go to the ground, it did, but it was Donia with a memorable moment, almost had that arm bar. But good defense for Victoria Anthony. Yeah. Gives, yeah, go ahead. And you can see, Raheel and Alex, that, uh, you know, that big wrestling background, uh, it'll save you from some things, but there are also things that it makes you vulnerable to. And so, you know, the, luckily, whenever you have that high level, you can overcome those things where some people couldn't. And, uh, you know, she is a master at positioning her weight. She's a master at positioning her body. And so, uh, you know, to, to be close in that arm bar, that was really, really tight. Uh, you know, it's that wrestling background and the grit. Even if she would have gotten it, I don't know if she would have tapped. She probably would have got out of it and fought her with one arm, knowing wrestlers. And she kind of picked her up, too. She probably slammed her way out of it before she tapped. Yeah. Do you want to send some love to everyone watching on YouTube and on our social media pages, on Facebook, on the Fury FC Facebook page. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember, we go 
live on UFC Fight Pass at 4.30 p.m. for Moran versus Trujillo for that 125 title. 4.30 p.m. start on UFC Fight Pass. Instant distance closure. Once she commits to shooting, there's just no space. She used a little bit of a head and arm throw in her, in her takedown in the first round. That's pretty, you know, common in especially female wrestling, but also in judo. I just did a whole one week defense on head and arm throws, and then one week offense on scar fold attacks. Finally, I'm going to understand some of Mike's crafty game. <laughs> he taught me move, and I just didn't really get it, but then from a different position, I showed the same move unknowingly. Oh, Donnie going for a guillotine, but she went both way too high up. If you force a front headlock like that, you'll get you'll get your body you'll get body locked and and they'll usually duck under. It's one thing the front headlock's awesome, but if you force it, you'll give up your hips. Yeah, and you, you can tell Danny does not want this to go to the ground. It's really difficult. Even if you're surviving, it's really difficult to get the weight of a you know a high level wrestler off of you. So you can tell she's fighting really really hard to keep this on the feet and really wants some distance. You see all that force Victoria is using right now. A nice little turn there. Oh, nope. Almost had it, did Danya. But she is applying so much pressure. That was interesting to see Victoria back off. Good for her. She's not content with just putting her on the cage and, you know, kind of coasting to a clinch victory. Man, Alex, I think she just wants some runway. She's trying to pull Danya back <laughs> and pull her back toward her to the cage. So she's got a little runway. I think she wants to go for those big blast double legs. I need some nice exchanges here. Yeah, here you go. Yeah, she wanted her in the center of the cage, yeah, Mike, sure. Yeah. yeah, now once she gets here, she doesn't have the cage to help her get up. That was so fast. <laughs> that was yeah. beautiful. It's almost like Olympic level. Yeah, and man, Victoria Anthony is wound so tight. Yeah. Her, all her movements are so fast. Yeah. She's an alternate for Team USA has competed in all the big world events. As we mentioned, 10 straight national teams. Donnie's framing, framing well. The frame just literally just got slipped. But, I mean, you can see Victoria on top. She's got her own legs figure forward and half guard, just pinning the hips. And that half guard's wide open. She's no interest in passing it. Yeah, I think she just needs to shift her weight to the other side and maybe throw punches with the left hand instead of the right. I mean, that's the more effective side. It's the face side. And I don't think she'd have any problem controlling her still from that side. All right, round three, here we come. Still have two more amateur fights here for you. Two pro fights on our prelims broadcast. And then we head to our main card. Take a look at our highlights for round two. To Victoria Anthony throws that big overhand left and then just closes the distance with it. Fighting a little against the cage and then gave Daniel some space. Throws that overhand again, and you could tell she just wanted some runway. She wanted to get this to the center and wanted to make sure that she got to the center. But high-level wrestling, some beautiful wrestling to watch. I like to see her open up the hands a little bit. But, yeah, you know, hard to complain about such a dominant performance from uh, Victoria Anthony so far. I want to send some love to all of our friends who are watching at some watch parties. I know a lot of gyms have a lot of local fighters and fighters. So if you're at a watch party, thank you so much for watching and tuning in and casting us on your big screens. Rio Mzomli here with Michael Alexander, Alex Morono. And Turner throws that, that one, two, and then usually closes the distance. She backs out there twice after. Still in that left hand. I expect Daniel's going to open up a little bit here in the third round and just go for bro because she knows she's down two rounds to none. You know, she really needs a finish here to to get a win, uh, in my opinion. Uh, you know, Victoria has done a good job of s just smothering her on the ground, and there we go again, right to the right to the ground. You see the aggravation and frustration on Dania's face. Yeah, 
You know, Danya has been in this position multiple times. She has so much cage experience, but you're going up against somebody with that much experience on the wrestling side, and the ground game just can be so suffocating with that pressure. It's a little bit different. Saw so Danya try to open up a little bit with that striking. What we always talk about with wrestlers, as soon as there's some kind of trouble, you always have that exit, right? You can always take it to the ground. You can yeah. get somebody there because of your experience. Yeah, and it's not just getting them down. It's, man, it's just the smothering style once you get there. It's, they don't give you any space. And, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's very, very frustrating to, re to roll with a good wrestler. Uh, you know, much less being an MMA fight where you can't get a punch off. You can never get to a good angle. You can never get a, you know, get to a, a good position. It's really, really difficult whenever the wrestling's this good. Yeah, Donnie had a really good wizard there. She built her base, but I mean, that's just something Victoria, I'm sure, has dealt with thousands and thousands of times. Nearing the one minute mark. Final round. For this 110 pound catch weight fight. Still have a title on the line. Our light heavyweight title coming up here. Fury amateur title. A reversal attempt here from Dania. Even if she did get a reversal, it wouldn't really matter. I mean, it, it, there's, it, this is such a hard way to find a win here for Donnie right now. I mean. She's going to have to try to... Oh, nice a button. Throw. Nope, that's it. Hara Goshi. It's cool. All right, we're going to go to the judges' scorecards and see how they score in this one. Michael, you're going to head inside here shortly. A lot of respect here between these two competitors. We look at our round three highlights. It started on the feet, and we got a chance to see the strike of Donya Cruz a little bit. Sharp little double leg there, Victoria. Then it was a smothering style from Victoria Anthony. Don't forget, we've got a lot of events coming up. We've got Fury Challenger Series 6 coming up next Friday night in Galveston. Making our way to Galveston. How cool is that, man? Yeah, that'll be fun. I, I go to Galveston a lot. I've never been to that Moody Garden Center, and that's where the fights are. So, man, I'm really excited. You know, we actually got a guy, Cameron Graves, who's going to fight in pretty short notice. Um, so, yeah, that'll be fun. I'll be doing a little bit of coaching, mostly some commentary work. Cool venue, cool location. U.S. Cody Show. Owens will be on the call for that one. And then we head to Tulsa. Me and Michael Angs. Alexander will be there in Tulsa at the UMAC, which is one of the best facilities. It's all so much cool. We'll be up there on September 17th. But inside right now, let's see how the judges scored it. Here is Wayne Leggett. Ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds of combat, we go to the judges' scorecards for your decision. Brought to you by Space City Collective. All three judges score the fight 30 to 27, declaring a winner by unanimous decision, Victoria Vortex Anthony. Congratulations to Vortex Anthony. Michael Alexander is standing by inside with Victoria. I'm here with your winner, Victoria Anthony. Victoria, victorious again. The wrestling proved to be just too much. What's next for Victoria Anthony? More fights, getting better, taking the information that I just got from this fight, applying it and correcting everything perfectly. So are you after that Fury strap next? I mean, I know it's just, uh, you're just starting, but Fury is a pretty good place to be. Hell yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> All right, well, we look forward to seeing you again. We, uh, we can't wait to see you. Congratulations on the victory. We look forward to seeing you again. Your winner, Victoria Anthony. All right, nice win there for Victoria Anthony. As we quickly
clear out there. Final few pictures there. Let's get our next fighter inside. Here's Wayne. Please welcome to the blue corner, Carlos Cepeda. All right, this one is going to be wild. <laughs> Carlos Zepeda, second time inside the Fury FC cage, 1-0 and record. Last time out, got a win over Marat, Curly Kebab at Fury Challenger Series 3, which was a strange one. I don't know if y'all remember that or not, but that was the one where Marat was looking at Professor Joe Solis. Something happened, left his hands down, and got knocked the heck out. Yeah, oh yeah, that was a bad one. And that fight was 85. This was, I think, a catch at 75. But, uh, you know, both guys have fought at 85 in the past. It was pretty much 85 is fighting at just below that 180-pound range. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, both guys are known for their for their knockouts and power in their hands. This was uh, this was my, this was circle on my, I don't want to say fight of the night, but, I mean, probably going to see a finish on the feet. Yeah, anytime you have two wild strikers like this that will go in there and just bang it out, not only do you have the chance of a big knockout, but either way, you just know it's going to be a fun fight. We don't get many fighters from Seguin, Texas as well, so that's kind of cool. <laughs> so shout out to Carlos Zepeda. Training at Montana Fighting Systems. He is inside. Let's get his opponent. Please welcome to the red corner, Lee Charles. <laughs> Okay, so the next two fights, we have competition for the best nicknames in Fury. Lee Charles, no mother effing refunds. All right, that's a great one. And then, of course, Jeremy DeLeon, who's going to be fighting for that strap coming up. Your mom's new boyfriend, which is also really epic. But right now, Lee Charles, seven time inside the Fury amateur cage. Has fought for the welterweight strap before, earlier this year. Lost that, came back, got a nice win over Jason Pineda at FC 78 in April. Now, he does get finishes, but can't go the distance as well, which is a good thing for an amateur. Yeah, yeah, Lee Charles is well-rounded. You know, he's got great takedowns, great takedown defense. He's just a big physical guy. But man, he's one of the few guys I've ever seen who like has that death touch, man. He's one of the guys who doesn't have to land the hardest punches to like really put you out. I don't know, I was so curious on like the physiology behind that, whether it's bone density or like, I, I don't know, I couldn't tell you, but it's one of those guys. We see our Taylor Tate brought to you by Space City Collective, the Reach Advantage Hype. Reach Advantage Hype Advantage going to Lee Charles, AKA no mother effing refunds. <laughs> Here's Wade for our official introduction. The following contest brought to you by Space City Collective is scheduled for three rounds in the Fury Amateur Series at a catch weight of 175 pounds. Introducing first fighting out of the blue corner, representing Montaña Fighting Systems. This mixed martial artist stands 5 feet 11 inches tall and he weighed in at 174 pounds. Fighting out of Seguin, Texas, he holds an amateur record of two wins, two losses. This is Carlos Zepeda. And introducing his opponent across the cage, fighting out of the red corner. Representing the Ward Training Center, this freestyle fighter stands six feet tall, and he weighed in officially at 179.6 pounds. Fighting out of Houston, Texas, he holds an amateur record of five wins, only one defeat. This is no refunds, Lee Charles. Your referee in charge of the action, Professor Joe Solis. Wayne left a little bit of his nickname out of there. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, uh, don't forget the tilde, a huge difference between Montana and Montana. Yeah. <laughs> Just want to mention that. Shout out to uh, Montana Fighting Systems. I'm sure they're watching like, hey, wait, we're not in Montana. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. It's a mistake anyone could have made, Raheel. <laughs> it's a nice little, little check left hook there from Lee. We've seen him sleep guys with that seemingly small punch. Nice low kick there from... The Sakeem fighter, big kick there from Lee. You know, Alex, you're mentioning like some people just have that death touch, but 
man, I want to get the measurements of Lee's hands because they are huge. <laughs> I don't know, y'all. You can just see how big they are right now. Ooh. Oh, man. Oh, man. Here we go. Oh, man. Oh, this guy's just <laughs> sitting in the trade. Yeah, this is kind of what we expected. It took about 45 seconds, but they got into it immediately. That's the third good low kick there of uh, Zepeda. He needs either to plan and throw the right hand or start checking those kicks. Lee Charles, before fighting for that welterweight title, was on a four-fight win streak. And that title fight was strange. The, the champ's pace oh. and style was so hard to figure out. I know Lee was beating himself over it, but I mean, it was tricky. He came back and you know, won a, a good decision, technical everywhere, a little more patient. You know, this is Cepeda's fifth fight, you know, Lee's seventh fight. These guys are both very experienced. They're showing it with how measured they are. Can y'all believe it? We were just calling that fight January 2023, and we are already near September. Man, time flies when you're having fun. Nice little two-piece there from Lee Charles. Acknowledged by Zepeda. You know if guys ever nod after they get hit, that means it was a good shot. Yeah, even if they nod, no. They, you know that was a good <laughs> shot. Yeah, I tell my guys that in combat, the best information is no information. Like, just don't show anything. Don't say anything. Just keep guessing. Nice little body kick there from Zepeda. Man, Zepeda's credit. He is pushing forward. He is throwing offense right now using those kicks to his advantage. It's funny, you can see where Zepeda's hands are up because like right on his hairline, right on his forehead, there's a bunch of red shots from the punches of Lee Charles. Oh, like man. those. A little wizard kick attempt there from Zepeda, but Lee Charles is just too physical, too strong coming forward. God, do we have to stop, stop the round? Let's just, <laughs> can we just run through it? Nice. Man, that was a good first round. Yeah, it was. Lived up the expectations for sure. Ooh. Yeah, both guys landing pretty well there in the first round. Zepeda throwing a few leg kicks. Lee Charles with a few big punches. And like you said, Alex, a few knots on the head right above where the hands would be of Zepeda. And here's that exchange where they just both stuck their foot in the tire and just went at it. <laughs> A good stick jab there from Lee. Yeah, Lee is getting really, really close to landing that overhand right where he wants it. He came just short there. Maybe it was a little bit low, but that's one of those punches like we saw earlier, Alex, where if it hits like right on the back of the ear, that's, you know, especially from Lee Charles, that's one that's going to be hard to stay away from. So Penn is showing good head movement, though, good footwork. He's moving well. He's taking a few jabs, but nothing too serious. All right, round two. Let's see if that overhand right is a factor here. In round two, what adjustments were made. Another big kick there from Zepeda. Well, if you watch, whenever Zepeda comes in, he leans down to his right whenever he's throwing combinations, when he's throwing punch combinations. And that's where he's going to get in a little bit of trouble with that overhand right. If he catches him just at the right time, he's going to go right over that right hand or that left hand of Zepeda, and he's going to catch him. So he's got to be really, really careful. He's got good head movement until he starts punching, and his head's kind of just leaning to the right, and he's kind of ducking in there. Yeah, Lee Charles also has a nice little lead hook. He can kind of change the angle, make it like a hybrid uppercut. He can exploit that consistent pattern head position. <laughs> the yellow yeah. punch. Yeah, combo there from Zepeda. <laughs> High kick, kind of you know, swung through for a big spinning back fist. Oh, big right oh. hand from Lee. Zepeda reacts well, though. I mean, he's been hit with some big shots and stays tight and comes forward. Yeah, and that's the right thing to do is, you know, as soon as you take a shot, if you keep coming forward, as long as you're coherent, you don't want to, you know, keep coming forward if you're a little loopy. Nice little right uppercut. I think he picked up on that head placement you were talking about, Mike. 
Charles had a nice little counter right uppercut. Didn't overload it at all. Really clean punch. Notice how Lee's kind of holding the center of the cage. Also, oh. He's kind of circling to the outside. And good connect there from Charles. As if he had made that movement forward. That might have landed on the nice spot there, that body kick from Zepeda. Saw Lee Charles' elbows go straight down to his sides. It's no worse for the wear, though, right back in it. 45 seconds left in round two. Oh. And it's one of those that's hard to call because I'm just holding my breath. Yeah. Waiting on <laughs> one of these guys is going to connect here in just a second. It's going to be something devastating. Nice knee right at the center there from Lee. He's got a really investing that underhook nice. They did a good job beating that takedown. Ten seconds left. Yeah, Lee doing a good job of fighting. Oh. Ooh, nice. Yeah, it was a big moment. Lee staying on his feet was big there. So that was a pretty close round. I'd say the, uh, the, the the punching and positioning of Lee was the uh, the edge, in my opinion, for that round. You know, he was he was the one kind of pressing for it and throwing a little bit more. Albeit, Zepeda was, was doing good. He was, he was throwing his own offense, but he just wasn't able to pressure for it as much. So, you know, when the striking is even, I would say the aggressor, the one coming forward, holding the ground, usually can edge it out, but... Ooh, nice, nice jab, jab there Lee. Oh, man, that's a big one right there. You can tell that leg kick kind of hurt because he wasn't really in a position to shoot, but he just wanted to close the distance and grab a hold of him for a second. Lee Charles said no thanks to the stool. Both, both breaks there. Danny, even after eating so many of those kicks, yeah, <laughs> yeah, my games, I'd be sitting down so fast. <laughs> Lee is a tough dude, and so is Carlos Zepeda. And you know, fifth fight here as an amateur for Carlos, seventh for Lee, and both these guys look like pros. Yeah, they really do. Yeah, I think with Lee, it's, you know, he's got to get his weight under control. I think he's small for a middleweight. Um, I think he could easily fight at 170. Um, but, you know, other than that, even if he is going to go up to, you know, 185, and, I mean, I think he's, because of those heavy hands, Alex, he can contend with, with uh, anyone in the regional level at least. Yeah, and sometimes being a little smaller for a weight class, you have a speed advantage. And, and if you got the power with it, then, man. Lee, by the way, came in at 179.6 on the scales yesterday. For the catch weight, 175. Man, this is going to be a tough fight to call. I mean, judging wise, I mean, both rounds are really close. I do think Lee Charles is, is up in both rounds, but, and both really close rounds, but it's just. When you don't see like significant damage on either one it's really difficult to, to tell when it's been kind of a one it's the fight's gone one way it's been standing only yeah yeah i, I think both guys have thrown a pretty similar amount i do believe he's landed a little bit more yeah especially with the boxing spade has some really good moments with his kicks it's been good evenly fought match so far oh back to back connects there for zapata but I mean, hey, to Lee's credit, he just shakes him off and keeps moving forward. Yeah, he checked that last kick pretty well. Cepeda knows he's having some success with that low kick. Ooh. Lee's corner calling for him to go right now, under one minute approaching. And his legs are going to be a chewed up tomorrow for sure. Oh, nice. They both exchange right hands. And the Cepeda's pressuring a bit more in this third round. Oh, oh, man. Nice little combo from Lee Charles. 
Spade, though, like I said, he just he yeah. kind of stayed in position, moved his head, and, and, and threw a punch back. Good counter work there from Carlos, man. This what, is... What's dangerous is when you get hit, when you move backwards, you're in a way worse position to absorb a strike. Oh, oh. man. <laughs> Both guys traded shots there. This is an absolute battle. 20 seconds left. Who has that final flurry left in them? Like we saw in that heavyweight fight, this is more than enough time to find a finish. A nice knee there from Lee Charles. Looks like this is going to end up with some dirty boxing against the cage, and that's it. Man, that was awesome. All that's, right, that's judges. Fight. Yeah, the judges are going to have their work cut out for them here. Yeah, good luck to those guys. Do we even want to take a shot at who we have winning? I I got it 29-28 Lee. I think he won rounds one and two. Uh, round one narrow, round three I believe was some painters. But I mean, that was just a good fun fight, good experience for both guys. Anytime we get to see guys stand for three threes and just kind of box it up, that's always fun. Yeah, and just knowing what we saw earlier, I think we're going to have a split decision um, here. I think that there's going to be one of the judges that saw it go uh, Carlos Cepeda's way. Um, but I do think Lee Charles is probably in the majority here, uh, the winner, just because of the punches that he did land. Uh, you know, I don't know how much credit they'll give to the leg, leg kick since they didn't seem to have that much uh, that much effect on him. Lee Charles in there, looks like he may uh, have a problem with oh, bicep. Man, it looks like he tore his bike. Uh, I don't know, I don't want to jump to conclusions, oh, yeah, but there's yeah, a that big old good. gap there. Yeah, he's got a, uh, a knot there on his bicep. Really tough to tell if it's uh, just a cramp or. I mean, oh no, that's uh, that's that's right. That I mean, is not I've right. seen a few of those in my day. When you get that big of a gap, and Lee's a muscular guy. Ooh, yeah, that hurts, man. Oh, uh, so painful. I wonder when he when that happened because after the fight ended. He wasn't grabbing at it until just now. You know, sometimes when, when the fight's over and, and that, that, that re relief happens, that it's finished, and your adrenaline kind of shuts off, that's when you start to feel some weird stuff. Oh. Oh, man. He is in a lot of pain right now. All right, doctors are looking at him. Judges are calculating their scores. I can't believe this doctor is still here. When I was an amateur, <laughs> he was the doctor, and he was old then. I mean, no offense, but. <laughs> it's called a lot of wisdom. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah, and I think. Um, with this type of injury, they need to let him stand up. They need to let him get up there because, you know, he may, may very well have won this fight. So, um, you know, let him stand up there. Let him... Ooh, just don't raise that hand up. Yeah, I think done. the doctor's hurting him. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's make this thing official and find out how the judge scored it. Here's a win like it. Ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds of combat, we go to the judges' scorecards for your decision. Brought to you by Space City Collective. Judge Ricardo Delgado scores the fight 29-28 Zapeta. Does Daniel Guevara scores the fight 30-27 Charles. Judge Michelle Morales scores the fight 29-28, declaring a winner by split decision, Carlos Zapata! That goes to show close with me, 30-27 Lee, and then that guy wins it. Respectfully disagree, but congratulations to Zapata. And man, I, I pray for, uh, you know, not the worst news from Lee and a quick recovery. All right, let's take a look at that moment where we saw the pain set in for Lee. You can see like right now, this oh. is where it kicks in. That's yeah, kind of one of those moments where you're like, yeah, I think I just won that. Wait, what happened? What? Yeah. What is this? Like a bee stinging you or something. And so Lee is getting looked at uh, by 
the doctors, but now let's get a title fight going. Please welcome to the blue corner, Jeremy DeLeon. Jeremy DeLeon, a.k.a. your mom's new boyfriend. Love saying that nickname, so good. He gets a chance to compete for a title. Light heavyweight title on the line here at Fury Amateurs. Jeremy DeLeon bringing in that 2-2 two two record, and this fight is actually a rematch. Martin Pineda and Jeremy DeLeon squared off. It was Jeremy's last fight. It was Martin's fight two fights ago, so they get a chance to run this back. Martin won that fight round three. And now we get a chance to see if Jeremy can win this one. Yeah, I love rematches because there's always an X factor that's not present in the original match. So I really do like rematches just because of that. There's maybe a little extra grudge. There's maybe a little bit of bad blood. So I think it just makes the fight much better whenever it's a rematch as opposed to, you know, the kind of the unknown. These guys know each other. They know what to expect from each other. And the fight wasn't that long ago. Like you said, it was Jeremy's last fight. It was Martin's fight before. So... Uh, I expect this to be really explosive, and I don't expect it to go the full time, the, all three rounds, or all five rounds. Yeah, it's cool to see these guys getting in good shape, dropping down a weight class fight now at 205. Good for these guys. A lot of self-improvement, uh, and, you know, just being really a good martial artist, good athlete. All right, Jeremy is inside. Let's meet his opponent. Please welcome to the red corner, Martin Pineda. Martin Pineda, 3-0 record, third time inside the, or excuse me, fourth time inside the Fury MC cage. Last fight did beat Aaron Meschini via Kimura in June at Fury Amateur Series 50, and that was a nice win, had a really good submission there. As a martial artist, it's important to admit when you are wrong. And man, every time Martin fights, I'm like, there's no way he can sustain this pace. And every time he sustains the pace and finishes strong. But look, believe it or not, this guy is a cardio machine. He fights at high pace. He throws pretty much everything into every shot. He goes for takedowns, goes for subs. And he doesn't really fade, man. I I've become a fan of watching him fight. Because he's just like all action all the time. And now he's got a belt, you know, right in the grasp of his fingertips. This will be a really fun fight. You know, both of these guys, Martin and Jeremy, going back watching that fight at Fury Challenge Series 3 that ended in round 3 in favor of Martin. They both were pushing forward the entire time. And that was actually one of the things, talking to Jeremy's coach in that strong style. They actually told him, like, hey, this time around, be a little bit more measured. Be aggressive, but you don't have to keep pushing forward that much. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this is a five-rounder. So, I mean, that, there's going to have to be some pace. There's going to have to be. Our tail of tape brought to you by Howler Head Whiskey. You see that reach advantage for Jeremy De Leon. Height advantage as well. Both guys did make way for this light heavyweight amateur title bout. Let's get some title official, excuse me, let's get some championship introductions. Here's Wayne. The following contest brought to you by the law office of Eric Smith is scheduled for five rounds and is for the Fury Amateur Series Light Heavyweight Championship. Introducing your first competitor fighting out of the blue corner. Representing Strong Style MMA, this mixed martial artist stands six feet tall and he weighed in officially at 202.4 pounds. Fighting out of Rosenberg, Texas, he holds an amateur record of two wins, two losses. Here is your mom's new boyfriend, Jeremy DeLeo! And introducing his opponent across the cage, fighting out of the red corner. Representing the dark side, this freestyle fighter stands 5 feet 9 inches tall, and he weighed in at 202.8 pounds. Fighting out of Houston, Texas, by way of Guerrero, Mexico, he holds a perfect amateur record. Three wins, no losses. Here is Martin Pineda. And now your referee, Patrick Petlon, with your final championship instructions. 
All right, gentlemen, we already went over the rules in the back. You know what's expected of you. I want a good, clean fight. Protect yourselves at all times. Obey my commands at all times. Touch gloves. Go to your corners. All right, championship instructions, the final ones. We continue our streak where there's no last weird instructions or rules. <laughs> Every 40 seconds, you must bark like a dog. Let's get this thing going. Title on the line. De Leon blue gloves. Pineda with the red. A rematch in the making. Both guys excited to get this going. You see those big overhand. He looked like he had a bat in his hand. Just <laughs> clubbed him over the head with it. Leo Seal, good mix-up game from both guys. I think they both are more grapplers than strikers, but they both will strike for sure. That's just kind of their gritty fighter side. Always down for a good scrap, but... Jeremy actually has a wrestling background that he doesn't show that much because he wants to literally go in there because he works around Fury FC's year a lot and also trains with the Strong Style crew. He literally wants to put on a show because Eric tells everyone, right, like, hey, go get some wins. Don't just ride to a win. Go get it. Go earn it. And he just wants to put on a show. Yeah, good, good, like, hip awareness for both guys in this clinch. Yeah, to your point, Raheel, you know, just about every show before the, the main card, one of us goes up to the locker rooms and tells them, look, this is a... Uh, You've got to put it on the line here. You want some mic time. You want to get noticed. Uh, it, that happens with finishes, and uh, it never fails. Every time we go up there and have that speech with them, the fights come out, and they're just blazing hands. Strong style MMA is also going to have Josh Aliman, the highly anticipated oh, yeah. debut on our main card, the master of the flying knee. And props to Oliver. It does not have an easy debut. Two. I mean, but that's how you become a forged fighter. Tony Toro is a bad man with a lot of experience, a lot more experience than Josh Aliman. And the strong style MMA coaches told us that they wanted to pick a hard fight for Aliman. They don't yeah. want an easy fight because they see something special in him. They want to get him ready. Man, that was a, a, a little... It's a tricky single leg. You can see Pineda's right hand is still kind of trapped under the leg. Gillian's got a wrist ride. He's a little high, though. Nice. Pineda plays on the backside. Ooh. Lands some big shots. Yeah, there's those big clubs coming down from Pineda. He's right in this corner, too. Yeah, yeah putting a lot of pressure here. Gillian's really trying to create space to get up. Yeah, they're not going to oh. let this go forever. Even though it's a title fight, it's an amateur fight. They're not going to let him go. They're not oh. going to let De Leon take a lot of punishment here. De Leon was doing a really good job actively controlling the wrist. I mean, he was, like, really, really trying to control the arms. I, I think that's good defense. I don't think any shots are really getting through. It's okay. only eight seconds to control the wrist. Uh-oh, but he still has to be careful. Yeah. And that is it. Oh. You don't want to play with fire too oh, much. Man. Martin Pineda gets the title. Two seconds left, and we have ourselves a new 205 champion. Congratulations to Martin Pineda. Yeah, you know, uh, Galeon's not really contesting it. That was good stop. Good for Pineda for just keeping his foot on these gas. Man, I'm not 100% sure he was heard his corner yelling out the time and maybe just waited the clock out and gambled with it. And, yeah. you know, he just, he lost that gamble. I think he was just waiting. I think he thought he could make it to the clock. He didn't look like he was hurt too bad. I think he just knows he made a mistake and letting him land those last few punches. See, Alex, here it is. Like, you don't want to play with fire. And I know you're trying to defend yourself, but... Patrick Pavan was inching closer and closer. And this final flurry right here, that was it. And I think at that point, it was a good stop. Yeah, you know, I, think, I, yeah. I stand corrected. I agree. He was actively defending, but that final three or four seconds, it looked like it was enough. Yeah. Props to both guys. It was a fun fight while it lasted. Well, didn't have a round one finish. I thought this one was going to be at least four or five, but let's make this official. We have ourselves a new champion.
Ladies and gentlemen, referee Patrick Patlon stops the fight. Two minutes, 57 seconds into the very first round. Declaring a winner by TKO and new Fury Amateur Series light heavyweight champion, Martin Pineda. I'm here with your winner, Martin Pineda. Martin, you got one of those coveted Fury straps. How does it feel to be the champ? Man, it feels good. My team knows how hard I work for this. I've been coming for years. It's just shit gets in the way. Um, shout out to my girl. I just had my baby two weeks ago. She, she held it down so I could still make it to train, still get my miles in, get everything in. After this, I'm coming for that 85, but I just need a month or two off, Eric, race my baby. Uh, I did three fights in five months for you. Give me a month off. Uh, I'll get that fourth fight in before the end of the year. Get two belts. So, Martin, speaking of this, is that, is that what you want next? You want the 185 strap? And then any thought of going pro after this? Yes, sir. We can get the 185, spend the rest of my amateur career getting the weight down, and we'll go pro for sure. Just got to get the weight at the right, right, right spot. Got it. Well, congratulations on the baby and congratulations on the belt. It was an honor to call the fight. Your winner, Martin Pineda. Man, congratulations to Martin, and that's a huge accomplishment. And shout out to his entire team at Dark Side. What an accomplishment, man. All right, we got some pro fights. We got two pro fights here on our prelims broadcast. Let's get our first pro fighter out. Here is Wayne Luggett. Please welcome to the blue corner, Christian Lopez. All right, Christian Lopez, six time inside the Fury FC cage, one and four record. Has been finished in every fight. Of course, the most memorable moment that we remember of Christian Lopez, that KO of Ali, Oliver Jimenez, caught the kick perfectly, and that was it. Yeah, that was wild. And in his next fight, he was getting double-edged and posted and dislocated his elbow. I mean, I actually use those fights specifically as examples for my young students on why we do not post. I mean, it's always unfortunate when that happens, but like, if there's no lessons learned from it, then, you know, then there's no value in, you know, the experience, and, uh, man, you just can't do that. Yeah, it was a weird, that was a couple, you know, the best win of his career, followed by a really bad loss. You know, those, those are always preventable, but you don't post. You know, get the win knocked out of your worst, get taken down, but don't post it out. Then we got a good fun fight, you know, Christian's, uh, built very similarly to his opponent. You know, both guys prefer to strike. It's a good pro fight to kick off our pro portion of this card. One thing about Christian Lopez, he will bring the fight to you, and he is a wild man inside. He is inside the cage. There's Wayne. I don't see him. There he is. All right, let's meet his opponent. <laughs> Please welcome to the red corner, Gabby Echeverry. Gabby Echeverry, the glory. Six time inside the Fury FC cage. Four and one overall record, Michael. Yeah, Gabby Echeverry is one of those guys that... Man, he's really tough, he's really long, and you're right, Alex, they almost look identical build-wise, uh, you know, but Gabby Echeverry is very, very dangerous. I mean, he's on a two-fight win streak, he beat Steven Perez at, uh, at Fury FC 80 just, just two events ago uh, by split decision, uh, and then, at, you know, of course, that's round one TKO in the Fury Challenger Series, but, uh, you know, he's at this 135-pound division. Fury is absolutely stacked, and, you know, it's... Uh, He's got to be careful. Christian Lopez is one of the, is a dangerous guy in my opinion. He's one of the, he's the most dangerous kind of opponent you can have uh, because you've seen what he can do, you've seen what he has done. So you just got to wonder when he's going to realize that potential. So Gabby Echeverry, he's got his work cut out for him and he's taking it very serious here today. Oh, yeah, he has to. You see the record, like, oh, I mean, I can beat this guy easy, but that's just not how it works in May. It's so weird how records don't always tell the tale. And uh, he's got to be on his A game and use his, his wealth of technique and knowledge to try to find a victory in this fight. Our tail of the tape brought to you by Live Oak Texas Vodka. The height advantage going to Christian Lopez and reach as well. The 29-year-old Gabby Echeverry trying to improve his record to 5-2. and two. He is inside. Let's get our official introductions for this pro fight. The following contest brought to you by Live Oak Texas Vodka is scheduled for three rounds in the Fury FC Bantamweight division. 
Introducing to you first fighting out of the blue corner. This freestyle fighter stands 5 feet 11 inches tall and he weighed in officially at 133.8 pounds. Fighting out of Houston, Texas. Today he looks for his second win as a pro. This is Christian the Cannibal Lopez. And introducing his opponent across the cage, fighting out of the red corner. This mixed martial artist is 5 feet 10 inches tall, and he weighed in at 134.8 pounds. Fighting out of Katy, Texas, his professional record stands at four wins, two losses. Here is Gabby, the glory, Echeverry. Your referee in charge, Jeff Rexroad. All right, Jeff Rexroad getting his first assignment for tonight. Gabby Etchberry coming off that nice win over Steven Perez, which was a dogfight at FC 80 in June. Split decision win. Big exchange, Gabby close to the distances. Christian really sat down in a hard combo. This is definitely the uh, the difference in these guys. Both guys can strike and have power, but I know Gabby's ground game is very, very strong. Christian doing a good job of using the cage to make sure that he doesn't. Well, that's gone now, but <laughs> that's very, very close to taking the, with the full back take here. And he's up against the cage, doesn't really have, he's got a full back take here. Gabby doesn't look like a 135er at all. He's such a big guy for this division. Man, I remember when he fought at 145. He was a big 45, then yeah. he dropped out at 35. Yeah, I know, it's crazy. Where did the weight go? And then Paris Moran <laughs> fought at 35, and he was a big 35, then dropped down to 25. I mean, yeah. He's our headliner tonight. Oh man, Gabby's got that choking arm in position yeah, under the old. chin, and it's figure forward. Not quite under the chin anymore. But man, yeah, Christian's got to peel that choking hand away, like now. I mean, now he's got to peel the supporting hand away, and it's in a position to peel. You got to grab high by the fingers. But the more time spent, the worse it's going to get. And this looks like it's going to be. Oh, he got the angle out. Good for Christian. Really turning hard. Good That's defense there. Those body triangles I mean, are really hard to rotate out of. Yeah, he was doing it right, but Echeverry just very good at maintaining that position. So the other arm under. Uh-oh, yeah, this is a uh, steep peel. He's going to peel the supporting hand oh. at the fingers. They grab right at the knuckles. Jeff Retro is getting close oh, Now it's even deeper yep. under. Oh. I think we're going to see a tap here in just a moment. Oh, Christian good peels hand. It away. Good hand play there. Yeah, for those of you at home, if you if you cannot get your, your closed hand behind the head of your opponent, just gable grip that, that rear naked choke. Don't try to, if you leave that in front of their face and they're able to pull that gate arm down, it's going to be really, really difficult to finish that rear naked choke. I'm not saying you can't, but, you know, it's, a, it's really, really difficult. See, that hand needs to go behind the head, not on the forehead. Because you see Lopez is able to pull it right down relieve that pressure and now oh, man. he's got kind of long arms himself that head grip is good that, that head grip is a really good underrated reversal grip on back takes oh men. now christian lopez teeing oh, off are big shots what a turn of events here gabby in on a little front headlock with the underhook more of a chin strap grip this is the turn Looked like Christian Lopez was in a world of trouble, but he <laughs> withstood everything. Good defense, gets back up, breaks that figure four. Flip the yeah. script, landed yeah. some pretty good ground strikes there from that wizard. Gabby's in on a high C, hits a big lift and a big dump, Daniel Cormier style. Yeah, man, I thought I thought uh, Christian was gonna. <laughs> I thought he was going to uh, post again. And <laughs> oh, God. I was like, his hand, he oh, looked like he was trying to get his hand back there to post and stop that takedown. Luckily, the, the takedown beat his hand. So, oh. yeah, that would have been devastating. His last one, it was pretty gross how he fell. But 
if he never makes that mistake again, man, yeah. that was brutal. <laughs> If he does make it, he's going to come over and sit beside you the rest of the fight. <laughs> <laughs> Under one minute, round one. Good punches there from the top by Gabby Etcheberry. And if you don't know at home, Raheel hates seeing blood or dislocated joints, and he's an oh. MMA commentator. Hey, man. <laughs> yeah. I'm in it for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. No, not really. Yeah. <laughs> the blood doesn't bother me as much. It's the dislocation. Oh, just don't want to see it. <laughs> just know what it means it's for the a, fighters. It's an unnatural thing to yeah. see for sure. My heart breaks for those guys, man, because then they're going to be out for such a long time. Christian going for a triangle. He, he does yeah, have to get the figure gonna... four locked up on that right side. There's not a lot of time to work, but, I mean, you can get put to sleep in 15 seconds. I guarantee it. Oh, for sure. He's really crowded up. Gabby's doing a good job really keeping just, like, the, the thoracic region of Christian just so bent and and compressed. Yeah, but Christian was able to reach up and grab his, his shin. I mean, that I'm just to make you should be able to close that up. If you can reach up and grab that shin with that much force, you should be able to close that up. Yeah, he was, he he was maybe pretty stacked. jammed up, yeah. I mean, these chokes were, were about as threatening as they get, you know, up, unless they could have been, like, really under the chin. But, I mean, Mike, you know, they don't have to be under the chin to finish by no. any means. <laughs> no, they don't. Uh, that jaw is just as effective and you know sometimes even if the chin's down and you're pushing the chin down into the neck It'll cut the blood off from those arteries. Oh, yeah, and I see guys go to sleep with yeah, that chin. You'll go to sleep even with your chin down And so it doesn't have to be like that the key to that on the grinning and chokes is to not have that That gate arm in the front of the head anywhere. You gotta snake those in behind the head You want your knuckles facing the back of their head. You don't even want your palm facing it because that leaves it open for them to pull that palm right around the, the dome of your head so you got to do that so if they've got that and you're not able to get it just keep that gable grip until they're able to it really really effective. it makes a difference between finishing that choke and blowing your arms out round two nice opening kick there for christian lopez oh not as hard as that one <laughs> Oh, oh I can get from Lopez. All right. Kick package on display. Oh. Oh, man. oh big here goes combo from Lopez. Man, that's the thing about Lopez. He'll let it hang out. He'll make some mistakes, but he's really good at recovering from his mistakes. And, you know, I just think as the fight wears on that, you know, those mistakes, you get a little more clumsy with them. And then, you know, that's whenever people make you pay for them. But, man, early in the fight when you're fresh, he's, he goes for it, Alex. Hey, man, there's some good shots in the gap. She's like, all right, it's wrestling time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Christian Lopez, last fight, did lose to Carlos Jimenez. He was part of that historic triangle run at Fury Challenger Series 4. Do you remember that, Alex? Yeah, yeah. It was cool. I was actually just talking to Jimenez yesterday at a, at a grappling event. He's so much fun to watch. Michael, you were on the call for that one. No, you were on Challenger Series 3 mm -hmm. or 4. They yes. all run together. One right of now. those. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I was just counting, wrapped, yeah, I was counting the other day. I think this is, uh, I think the next event will be my 40th event that I've called for for Fury since wow. we've uh, since we've been here, and I think it's a, around 30 with you, 32 maybe with you, Raheel. Um I don't remember what the first number was, but and it just keeps getting better and better. I love calling fights with you guys. Likewise, yeah, likewise. Yeah. We're about to hit that two-year anniversary in November. Yeah. yeah. Good positioning here from Echeverry. Okay, maybe more back, more back control. Looks like he maybe considered a head and arm choke, but Krishna turned back through. He's got that half back take. Does Gabby Echeverry? He's so good on the ground. So much pressure. So fluid as well. There's still so much time to work on this round. He's got the little wrist rod action going. Christian's going for a straight arm bar, maybe. It's not great. He can't attack from the worst position possible. We shouldn't, I should say, should not attack from the worst position. We have seen some ankle locks. One ankle locked and Fury finished from when someone's back was taken. But. All right, let's see if Gabby can get a finish here this time around. This is deep. I mean, the choking, there's laying, they're laying on the choking arm, body triangle on the top side. It doesn't get any worse for Christian. It doesn't get any better for Gabby. Watch once Gabby gets that left arm free and he can connect him, whether it be palm to palm or figure four. He's oh, going to be working yeah. on a really potent choke here. 
Yeah, you see, he keeps trying to put that in front. It looks like he's trying to slide it behind a little that's more it. now. Oh, but that's it. That's, that's it. it. We're going to see a tap. Oh, yeah, that, that is it. it. He couldn't do it in the first, but he does it in the second. Gabby Echeverry with the tap of Christian Lopez moves his record now to five and two. All glory to the glory, Gabby Echeverry. Man, I, I really like the way, you know, Christian Lopez is now one and five, but regardless, I really like the way he fights. He goes in there the first couple of rounds, just lets it hang out. You know, he fights his own style of fight. Uh, you know, he definitely has some places to improve, especially on the ground, but I really like the way he lets it hang out. And uh, But Gabby's just too much too skilled for him in, in all the places. See right here, this was, uh, this was Christian Lopez. That's, it. That's how he wanted the fight to go. That, that was his best opportunity to win the fight. But once it gets to the ground, he's just no match for Gabby uh, when it comes to these kind of things. I mean, this rear naked choke set up was perfect this time. He yeah. got his arm right under the chin. And sometimes you got to take a look at, you know, if you're one in five and you get beat on the ground every time. You know, I just, could, I just can't relate or understand why you wouldn't do a billion jiu-jitsu class. Yeah. All right, let's make this thing official. Here's Wayne. Ladies and gentlemen, the end comes two minutes, 38 seconds into round number two, declaring her winner by tap out due to a rear naked choke. Gabby, the glory, Echeverry. Congratulations to Gabby Echeverry, 5-2 record now. Making that climb, making that noise in the bantamweight division. All right, let's get our final fight of our prelims. Here's our first fighter. Please welcome to the blue corner, Pena Alamov. Pena Alamov, third time inside the Fury FC cage, one and one record. But it was that last fight that went the distance where he got a big win over Gabriel. Calvario, and remember, he came out looking different. He looked more aggressive. The kicks were on point. The wrestling was great. He was a different fighter. Yeah, the first fight in his debut, he looked a little nervous. He looked a little reserved. He looked like he just, uh, you know, was, I mean, he looked like just the nerves got the best of him. In the second fight, he looked like a completely different fighter. He looked like a force here uh, in this division. So, uh, I know he's one and one, very young and 25 years old, and you know, he's from Turkmenistan, you know, just only been in the United States for three or four years. So uh, this guy is really fighting for something. I mean, he is, he wants to be the first Turk Turkmenistan fighter to make it to the UFC. Owns a business in Dallas, Texas, as a owns a mobile dog grooming business. So, you know, this guy is, is fighting for something. He's just an example of somebody who comes here, you know, basically with kind of, with the kind of his eyes closed and says, put me somewhere and I'll just make something happen. And then, you know, it's turned out to be uh, a, you know, pretty nice at, uh, at, in this weight class for a Fury Body Championship. All right, Pena is inside. Let's go meet his opponent. Please welcome to the red corner, Chris Solis. Chris Solis, second time inside the Fury FC cage. Hasn't fought since 2019 here at FC, uh, in Fury FC where he lost to Robert Henson at Fury FC 29. So making that return, it's been a while for Chris. Yeah, not fighting since 2019, I mean, that can mean a couple of things. That could mean there will be a lot of ring rust, or that could mean he's significantly improved. It just depends on how much he's trained and how much he's been in that room. So, you know, it just, you never know what to expect. This is basically like he's 0-1, he's lost his debut. This is basically his his number two debut. <laughs> yeah. Alex, do you remember? I remember Chris fighting on the Legacy Amateur card back, back in, uh, when Legacy was here. He, was, uh, he also fought on the Fury Amateur cards as well back in 2015. The only reason I remember him, I have a friend named Chris Solis. So I would always text him like, dude, you're up. <laughs> but man, Chris has been fighting since 2015. Our tail of the tape brought to you by OnlyFans. The reach advantage, height advantage for Pena Olimov, the 25-year-old, trying to get that second win. Let's get our official introductions. Here's Wayne Leggett. 
Ladies and gentlemen, the following contest brought to you by OnlyFans is scheduled for three rounds in the Fury FC featherweight division. Introducing to you first, fighting out of the blue corner. This mixed martial artist stands 5 feet 11 inches tall and he weighed in officially at 146.8 pounds. Fighting out of Oak Cliff, Texas by way of Mary Turkmenistan, here is Pena. Alamov! And introducing his opponent across the cage, fighting out of the red corner. This freestyle fighter stands 5 feet 6 inches tall, and he weighed in at 144.4 pounds. Fighting out of Houston, Texas, today he looks for his first win as a pro. Here is Chris Solis! Your referee in charge of the action, Jake Montalvo. All right, Jake Montalvo inside. I believe he was at a uh, contender series earlier this week. Or last week, so. Yeah, Jake Montalvo, he's everywhere. He is everywhere, Michael. All right. <laughs> a little slip up there. By the way, blue gloves for Pena and red for Chris. That Pena has a really tall karate stance style. And he's got kind of a wide stance, so it makes him a little bit susceptible to those leg kicks, but he seems to be avoiding them really, really well right now. Just be careful welcoming Salise on, because he'll come. Salidas is trying to figure out the puzzle of the, the size difference. You know, it's one thing to have a size advantage in the weight class, but you got to make weight. And that's one thing Penna did not. He came over a little bit. Yeah, 146.8. And it seems like we've had that, he's had that problem before, maybe in his debut or the, or the second fight. It seems like he missed weight at one of the other fights too. I could be wrong, but, um, you know, at, at 145 or, uh, you know, this, you're right, Alex, you have to make weight. Um, and it's, you know, it starts here because even with a big win, you know, not making weight can, you know, discount that to, to the guys watching him. Yeah, 100%. You know, scouting for the next level, I mean, because they do not want to match you up. They do not want to pull you up. If you have a history of, of, of missing weight, it's just, it's too risky for them. They just, they, I mean, it's really, you know, it's kind of like signing a half of a fighter. You know, maybe you got it, maybe you don't. Well, yeah, and then, like, and if you miss weight, your opponent could choose to not fight, rightfully so, and it's not their fault. It's the person who busts weight's fault. It's just a liability. And I actually don't think it's penalized enough. Like, as a, a fighter who's not huge for the weight class, I've never had an issue making weight. You're just fighting at a disadvantage if your opponent doesn't. He's such a big 145er, is Payne Olimo. He gets out under control. It's such a big advantage for him. So he's doing a good job staying a little more active. Remember, Olimov was a little, he's very, he's very patient in his last couple of fights. Mm. It's like right there, he was in a really good position for that straight right, kind of exited out through the high kick instead. You can tell he really likes to fight at a long range. Nice low kick. Yeah, at 25 years old and at 5'11", I just wonder if he maybe shouldn't try to put on some more muscle and go up to 155. Yeah, he wasn't that problem. And, nice and he'd be a little taller than the average 55er at that height. Yeah. Now Peta talking a little trash inside. Yeah, he's got to be careful with that. Yeah. If you remember in his first fight, he was doing that a little bit, and then <laughs> it didn't work out so well for him. So I'd like to see him just go in there and just take care of his business. He's just a talented fighter. And on the guillotine. So he's, in, he's not in the best position to finish it. Especially now Solis has the underhook. You see Solis' right arm is grabbing at the wrist. It he was go. bothering Solis. You can see it on his yeah, eyes, right? A, pu yeah. a punch yeah. hit him in the left eye. Okay. And it's just, he's been wiping away ever since it landed. 
sometimes your eyelid gets hit. You know, sometimes the guy's glove touch your actual eyeball. You gotta just kind of wipe it away. There's a little reddening under it, but you, know, you see him still kind of wiping it away. And there's a little cut just like right under his eyelid. I mean, right under his, uh, like the bottom part of his eyelid, bottom of his orbital. Hey, he's got to be careful here. You don't want to take one of those up kicks to the chin. So he's just trying to stay busy to, to make sure that he doesn't take another big punch here in this exchange. Oh, man, good timing there for Pena. By the way, no tilde on his name. Just want to point that out. We've been called out before, remember? Yeah. Okay, left arm under. Yeah, here we go. This so is dangerous. dangerous. Oh, yeah, this is really it's tight. It's pretty high, but again, it's not always a deal breaker. Yeah, same problem before. You cannot have that. Oh, he's got the arm trap. Let's see if he can keep it. Oh, now there's so the, the grip top and so it's, it's really hard to finish palm to palms if the chin is tough. Possible but challenging. You Ten figure four, it's a different animal. But yeah, Solis is no stranger, though, work on the ground. All right, Solis survives the round, and off to round two we go of our final fight of our prelims broadcast for Fury FC 82. Don't forget, we are going live at 4.30 p.m. Central Standard Time on UFC Fight Pass for Moran versus Trujillo. More than 125 title. Now, as you can see, as the round was ending, Ben Alamo had the back. He had a, the choke in, but he was, you could see he was just about to try to squeeze it out, and he heard the clap. So, the 10 second, he was like, All right, I'm going to ride this yeah. out. <laughs> I don't want to hold this for 10 seconds, but, you know, good, nice right hand there from Solis. Ben recovers really well, but, and it just happens to fall right on top of him. Lands a couple of punches from here. Nice hammer fist. And then takes the back and tries for that choke. You can see where, you know, about 10 seconds, whenever he heard the collapse, he decided, yeah. I'm not going to go for this anymore. I'm going to save my strength for the second round and just win this round, which I think he did, Alex. Yeah, I agree. Round two, that left eye. Yeah, Alex, it's getting a little bit puffy for Chris Solis. Underneath it. Well, my eyes look like that every single morning. <laughs> Ten month old and eight year old. Yeah, I've got a little bruise under mine yesterday. <laughs> I brag about it every time I come from Gracie Baja Woodlands from training. <laughs> Alex and his guys over there, very, very tough. Thank you. Yesterday was one of those days my wife got a little bit of a black eye today as well. Yeah. From the jiu-jitsu, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> of course, the gentle art. <laughs> so he's smiling a little bit in there because I think Pena is talking to him. I can't tell what he's saying, of course, but Pena Alamo talking to Solis in there. Yeah, he likes doing that. He uh, That's what keeps him engaged, I guess, inside the cage. Then and that's what it is. He looks extremely focused. He doesn't, doesn't seem to get too excited about any point of the fight. That's the thing. Pen Alamo will kind of snooze you, and then all of a sudden he'll just let a flurry go, and uh, you're kind of not expecting it. We're not as expecting it as the guys calling the fights, and they're definitely not expecting it as a guy in the fight. Yeah, Sleaze is struggling to, to close the distance to land a big shot. He's got to throw two and three. His coach is calling him to step in. I know it's scary, but I, I agree with that. Yes, the jab, got Alamov to react, hit the inside kick. He's going to go jab, jab into a right hand. Especially Alamov's gotten used to taking a one step back and being out of range. One step back, being out of range. He likely won't take a second step. So he really tries to breach it in. Ooh. Panda going for a highlight reel finish there. 
flying knee a little bit too far away, kind of caught him on the way down. I haven't seen him attempt that before. These flying knees are the most devastating when you catch your opponent when you're on the way up. You catch them on the way down, a lot of times you can land flat footed and they can go the other way, but you're doing a good job of staying out of the way. Under two minutes left in round two. Man, this is where I want to see Pena really, once he completes that walking down of Solis to unload a little bit, let those hands go. Yeah, he, he lets them off. I mean, being so big and you know, kind of talking some trash, he doesn't really throw that much. Like I normally would be so critical, but if you're going to kind of jaw up in there, you got to kind of back it up, you know? And we've seen him do it before, too. That's the thing. Like just such a talented fighter. Both guys, just they need more than one, even more than two. Give me three, give me four punches in a combo. I think they'll find a lot of success. Now, Dancy, you got to be calculated Ooh. when you enter. Trying to get Chris Solis to reach out and extend and get overextended on one of those punches. So he's staying tight in the pocket, though. So right there. Completes that task of pushing it back and back. And to the center we go again. These kicks have been on point again. Second straight fight. Yeah, and you got to wonder, you know, the Sean O'Malley fight was just a couple of weeks ago, and how many people saw that fight and saw that overextended punch and are trying that combination now. Oh, nice. This there. Nice check hook. And Penn doing a lot of damage to that low kick. He just landed that one, and so he's had to think twice about it. Ten seconds left. Another attempt for a highlight reel. All right, round three, here we come. Good entertaining round. Is Peta even sweating inside? I don't see any sweat on it. I was just thinking the same thing. His hair's not wet, there's no sweat. He's uh, not doing a lot of work in there, but he's still winning the fight, in my opinion. I mean, he's landing the better of the, of the exchanges, and. Uh, you know, land those leg kicks, and even though you know he's not throwing a lot, he is the aggressor. He's the one moving forward. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's, he's not he's been, even sweating. Yeah, he's been devastating with the kicks. He's just so patient, timing everything so perfectly, just waiting for his moments. I mean, those kicks were pretty devastating that round. Yeah, and I saw the the look you were talking about, Alex Chris Solis, after that leg kick. Like, uh, if he could have yeah. said out and grabbed it, he would have. <laughs> Jake Montalvo telling Pen Alamo, man, you gotta, you gotta sweat a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> he looks like us on the broadcast. Yeah, no I, know. Sweat. I think we're sweating a little bit more. And good cardio there for Pena, I guess. Chris's corner and teammates calling for him to get a little dirty in there. Come on, push it. Yeah, he's gonna have to here in this third round if he wants to win this fight. I think he's down two rounds to none. I think there's a pretty clear uh, two rounds up for Penn Alamo. Nice overhand right there, just missing, just missing again. I just think if he would pull that, he's kind of pulling back on that overhand right, Alex, before he pushes it forward. If he learned to throw that straight from that holster and get there a second faster, it may yeah. land. Is that a little... I spy Cameron Smotherman next to Eric Garcia there, bottom of the screen. Yeah, hopefully we'll see Cameron back in here before long. Yeah. One of our favorite fighters to call and you know, fan favorite also. Never been in a, in a <laughs> boring fight ever. There were talks on the Fury Unleashed podcast that Cam could go down to 125. Oh. 
Yeah. Another one in that 125 division. <laughs> God. Yeah, Pena here in the full mount now. Well, not quite the full mount, but a half guard mount, but back in the half guard now. Ooh, oh. man, big, big left elbows there, raining down and now into the punches. Ooh, Pena. He's got the neck. So he sits back just enough to put that guillotine out of range. Pena opted for it. Let me throw a few more heavy shots here. Yeah, that was smart of him to pull him over and not let him stay in the turtle position Ooh, until he got punches. this position. But these are big shots. Oh. As if he didn't get up, that would have been stopped very shortly after. Oh, yeah, Jake was taking a step toward him. He wasn't going to let him take very many more. And more coming in. Jake Montalvo looking, getting closer. See, he's got that wrist right, Alex. He's got that he's oh. reaching around the way. He's got that far wrist. Landing big punches here. Chris Solis absorbing them, still alive in this round, just past the halfway mark. But it's been all pain of all of them open round three. Yeah, wrist control right now is big for Solis, mitigating strike damage. Yeah, this is uh this is not good. Here we go again. This we're naked choke. We've attempt. We've seen a few times tonight. He's very aware. There you go. There's palm to palm. And he's squeezing hard there on that chin of Chris Solis. Not under the neck just yet, but still as devastating. It is hurting. And you can see Solis Ooh. is not comfortable there. And now that left arm sneaking under. Still. Good chin defense there. I just think Olomov has got to just slide his own fingers down between his face and the back of Solis's head in order to make this, you know, get this finish. I think that's all he's missing. If he just put his, that top hand in, in the correct position, I mean, this fight's going to be over. Five seconds left. Round three. Yeah, Pena dragging him to the ground. This is Pena Alamo's most dominant round so far. He's, he's dominated this entire third round. And a round that Solis really needed a finish in. Yeah. And just has had nothing so far. Pena being active, still doling out some punishment. Not just settling with riding this to a win. Ten seconds left. It's a bad position for Solis to finish in, but ten seconds. He's been off since 2019, so not a bad first fight back. Ken Alamo, a very tough opponent to take after a three-year or four-year uh, you know, layoff. Really, really difficult. Pena inside, a, it highlights on right now, but he is frustrated with himself for not finishing that fight. But let's take a look at the round three highlights. It was all Pena Alamo. Yeah, round three was by far his most dominant round. And, you know, Chris Solis had some nice moments in there, had some good exchanges, landed a few nice punches. You see a little bit of uh, Alamo's face, a little bit marked up over that left eye. But other than that, I mean, he looks pretty clean. Uh, looks like he took very minimal damage. His hair is still not wet, so I'm not sure if he's still sweating or barely. If he's sweating barely at all, but, you know, so, which tells me, Alex, he could have turned up the pressure a little bit, yeah. maybe finished that fight. I'd love to see him establish a little more of that killer instinct to be able to go in there and get those finishes whenever he's almost there, because there was two or three times where he was almost there to that finish. I think it was a little more, you know, just tenacity he could have gotten those finishes. It wasn't for lack of trying. I mean, he, no. he, he tried so many times. Chris Solis is a tough, tough dude. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think I'm going to wait for Chris Elise. He's going to be a tough opponent in this weight division for anyone, and I hope he gets back in there quickly. All right, let's see how the judges scored it. Here is Wade. Ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds of combat, we go to the judges' scorecards for your decision. Brought to you by Space City Collective. With scores of 30-27, 29-28, and 29-28, your winner by unanimous decision, Pena Alamo! Congratulations to Pena Alamo, 2-1 and one record, and a big congratulations to all of the winners on our Freelance broadcast of Fury FC82. On behalf of the entire Fury team, our DNA Studios production team, for Alex Morono and Michael Alexander, I'm Hilton Donnelly. We will talk to you at 4.30 p.m. for Fury FC82, 125 title on the line. Trujillo against Moran. Get your subscriptions now. We'll see you then.